right. All right, I'm going to share my screen, Perfect. assuming that I can, because now, of course, Keynote is gone from my share. Oh, no. Y'all. You can't make this stuff up. No. Never again. Never again. All right. Well, so you know what we're just going to do? We're going to share my whole desktop and hopefully I don't get text messages or whatever while we're talking. How about that? There you go. All right. Oh, now you can all see my email. Amazing. That's all right. There, there you we go. go. Here we go. All right. Okay. So tonight we are talking about choosing the hosting plan that works for you. Um, I want to first, before we do anything, just kind of go over quickly what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about briefly the different types of web hosting, um, figuring out which kind of hosting your project needs, and then three significant factors to evaluate and how to think about them um, when you are talking about web hosting. So first I'll introduce myself. Who am I and why do I know anything about this? Um, my title is Product Manager for E-Commerce Applications at Nexus Liquid Web. Um, and what that means basically is that I'm in charge of deciding what goes into our hosting plans for managed WordPress and managed Magento and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but also I have been working with WordPress and therefore buying hosting for 19 years now. Um, so this is, I'm not just a product manager. I'm also a client as they say. Um, also in case anyone is wondering, because I always get asked about this. Yes, that is an oil painting of Dwayne, the rock Johnson behind my head. Um, you're not imagining that that's really there. Um, I bring him to all my meetings. All right. So let's get started. Let's talk about types of web hosting. Um, there are so many, like I didn't even know how many there were until I started working professionally in web hosting. Um, you have everything down from like your $5 a month, super basic thing, all the way up to things like um, cloud services, infrastructure as a service, bare metal servers. Like it, it really kind of runs the whole gamut, right? Um, but for the purpose of this talk, because we are at a WordPress meetup and we are talking to folks who are look, looking to their WordPress meetup to advise them on hosting. We're going to talk about kind of the three common types at sort of, I don't want to say the entry level, because that sounds pejorative, but sort of at that like smaller, um, like when you don't have a whole IT department telling you what you need and you have to make the decision for yourself, it's usually one of three main types. There's like virtual machine hosting. There's like WordPress hosting, when you go to a when you go to a host website and look for the word WordPress, and then there's something called managed WordPress hosting. And so let's talk about each of these types and kind of the pros and cons of each one. Um, virtual machine hosting is usually called like virtual private server VPS, um, though sometimes people like get clever and give it different names. Like DigitalOcean calls it a droplet, and that's very cute, but really it's a VPS. Um, what that means by virtual is that your resources are isolated by software, not by hardware. So, so to be specific, what that means is you go in and you buy a virtual private server. You aren't assigned to a specific server on a rack somewhere in a data center. There's no physical box. This one is yours. Um, what it is, is that there is like a little sort of, there's this little like capsule running in software that's like, it's your own operating system, your own web server software, your own copy of PHP, all of that kind of stuff is sort of encapsulated. And on a on one of those servers in the rack or a cluster of servers, if you are doing cloud-based VPS, um, there might be 10, 50, 100, 1,000, 5,000 of them on that like unit of hardware, um, depending, on, um, depending on what kind of operation your host is running. So what does this mean for you? Um, you? It gives you more freedom, but also responsibility for the software stack on your server. What do I mean by that? Um, a VPS will deploy with a particular operating system and a particular, um, a couple of other particular things. But then after that, you have a lot of freedom to decide what you use on it. Do you want to use Apache as your web server? Do you want to use Nginx as your web server? Which versions of PHP do you want to have? How often do you want to update the operating system on your server? What kind of control panel do you want to use? You have freedom to do all of those things. You also have freedom to break all of those things. 
Um, and how much support you get for any one of those things kind of depends on the scope of support of your VPS provider. Um, if you are hosting WordPress on a VPS, any WordPress specific features may be provided by the control panel. So like for example, cPanel and Plesk both have something called the WP Toolkit, which comes with a bunch of like helpful WordPress features, but those are provided then as a function of the software, not as like a specific thing that your host is doing for you. You can put as many sites on your VPS as your server resources can support. And if you are using like a cloud-based um, VPS provider, which is I think what a lot of them are doing these days, um, you can resize your virtual machine as it gets, as you expend more of those resources, right? So if you suddenly find yourself needing more of something, you can just get more of it. You can just upsize it. Um, you will also frequently see these sold kind of the same way you would think of buying a computer, right? Um, how many processors, how much RAM, all of those things are specs typically that you would find in like a VPS hosting. Um, and then you can manage your sites to your liking, right? Because you're not getting any specific WordPress support from your host. It's up to you. You can run an old version of WordPress if you want to. Like if you really, really just want that like classic editor experience and you don't want to, and like the classic editor plugin is not enough for you, you could just run WordPress 4.8 forever if that's what you want to do. It's your, your, it's your server, you're the boss, you can do whatever you want. Um, it's very like non-opinionated that way, typically. And so this ten, ten, uh, kind of hosting tends to be best for like freelancers or small agencies, like anybody who like they really need their per site cost to be low. And so they are willing to do more of the technical lifting in order to achieve that, that low cost, right? Because you can cram a lot of WordPresses into, you know, a small to medium VPS, as long as none of them is like too heavily trafficked. So it's great for that kind of like freelancer, small agency use case. And then there's something that's called WordPress hosting. And really, in my opinion, WordPress hosting is what sort of like budget shared hosts started. They start, they call it that because people were who don't know anything about WordPress were coming to their sites going, what do I buy if I want to host WordPress? Um, the thing about like going up to like a like a budget host and asking for WordPress hosting um, is that there's not really very much that's WordPress specific about it, except maybe they'll like pre-install WordPress for you and like give you a button to install more WordPresses. Um, they're not giving you things like staging sites or like malware scans. They may not even be exposing their backups to you. So you may not be getting backups through them. Um, you have no responsibility at all for the software stack. Like they are never going to ask you <laughs> to update the operating system on the server. That's not, uh, that's their business, not yours. Um, their scope of support might not include WordPress issues. So um, everything on the hosting side is working fine, but your WordPress is throwing a fatal error and you contact support and say, what's up? They're like, man, that problem is with the code that you're running in your hosting account. I can't help you. Um, you may not get, they may not do much of anything for you in that case. They might offer to restore it to from backup, and that might be all that you get. Um, now, that doesn't mean this doesn't have its use. It's really good for like personal sites, um, experiments, like anything where like it's actually okay if you're not getting the most amazing support or if the site goes offline because something bro broke um, as long as it's cheap. And, you know, it's very economical. Like you can pay four or $5 a month for this and you do get what you pay for, but sometimes that's okay. Like if you're just kind of tinkering around with WordPress on a personal blog, why spend a lot of money on it, right? Why not just spend the $5 and have um, very economical hosting? Um, so that's, uh, so that is like WordPress hosting at that sort of like lower end price point. And then we have managed WordPress hosting. What do you mean by managed? That's what I get people ask me in the booth WordCamp all the time. Well, what do you mean when you say managed WordPress hosting? It can be shared or dedicated, um, but the software stack will be optimized specifically around WordPress and what WordPress needs. And it will have multiple like WordPress supporting features. So you might get uh, a free staging site to test plugin updates on. You may get... Um, regular backups. 
um, that are exposed to you in the portal, like all of the hosts, they are all taking backup. So whether or not they make them available to you is um, is another question. Um, there may be nightly malware scans. Their scope of support will probably include some WordPress specific troubleshooting. Like where I work um, at Nexus, like we can't, if you're running a plugin that breaks your WordPress, because look, it's like, it's always a plugin, right? Like we know that. Um, we may not be able to help you figure out what the specific problem is with that plugin that might be out of our scope, but we will at least do our best to help you figure out which plugin is causing a problem um, so that you can then seek support out from that plugins, uh, from that plugins developer. Um, a managed WordPress host also tends to have a very opinionated platform. And what I mean by that is a lot of choices are made for you. Like this is the kind of caching that we use on this site. And if you use some other kind of caching plugin that's incompatible with it, um, we may make you stop because you're like screwing up the performance of the server. Um, or because like, basically what we do is like, we decide like, this is how we are optimizing for WordPress on this platform. And so this is how we are going to, um, so this is how we're gonna configure a WordPress for maximum performance. Um, Sometimes you will see um, managed WordPress hosts like ban certain plugins because they cause performance issues. Like WP Engine, for example, man um, maintains a banned plugins list. And the stuff they're banning isn't like super duper common, but sometimes it's like broken link checkers and things like that that like consume a lot of resources. Um, and then, so of course, for all of that, like this tends to have a higher price per site. Um, managed WordPress typically starts at like 20 to $25 a month for a site. Um, the per site cost may go down as the, your spend goes up, but it is a higher, um, it's a higher price for the higher number of features that you get with the product. And this is good for like a business site um, that like, like when it goes down, like it's a problem <laughs> because suddenly you can't take orders or you can't uh, communicate with your customers. Um, it's also really good. Like we find um, a lot of our customers are agents like bigger agencies that can trade like that higher cost in exchange for just not having to deal with the platform. Um, you know, sometimes you just do that like, like cost benefit about balance. And you're like, I'd rather pay more per site, but then just not have to think about like anything underneath WordPress. So those are kind of the major types of WordPress hosting that we're really talking about. I'm gonna pause here for a second and see if anyone has questions. All right, I'm not seeing anyone come off mute. Nope, nothing in the chat yet um, either. Sweet. Okay, I'm going to move on. Yep. So the first question to ask yourself when you were getting ready to buy hosting is like, what kind of project do you have, right? Is it a, like, I have a, I had a project the other day that I was thinking about launching and I could not figure out where I should host it. And then I realized like, I don't care if this site goes down. I don't care um, if the site looks good, I'm just doing it like for tinkering purposes. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to go like fire up a managed WordPress for this. Like, I kind of don't care if it gets obliterated. Like, I'll take care of it myself. Like, I'm actually fine with not spending for managed WordPress with this. Um, so maybe I'll just host it on a, like on a, on a cheap option. Um, if you have a business and it is your main business, I would encourage you not to do that. Like friends don't let friends use cheap shared hosting for their mission critical business sites. Um, it's just not going to be a great experience for you. So that's question number one. But then like once you have decided on like a genre of WordPress hosting, there are still several selection factors that you have to think about. First one, most obviously, is the price. Okay. Okay. You want to know what you're going to spend. And here's the thing, like a lot of hosts will give you like an introductory price. And then at some point that price will increase sometimes quite sharply. Now where I work, the way we do that is we have like, there's, there's sort of a perennial discount on the front of the site where you get like your first three months at a certain percent off. And then it renews at the regular price. That regular price is still prominently listed on the front of the site. Some hosts will do this. And then this is in my opinion, especially prevalent with like kind of the budget WordPress hosting um, hosts is that like you will get an amazing deal for the first year and then it renews at like five times as much. Um, so you really want to make sure that you're like checking for like what the regular price is, not just the price that they're advertising when you sign up. 
Um, and also check like what happens if I decide I need more? This is the cost for one site. What if I have a second site? Um, what does like as the the plans go up, at least for the next like level or two, what does that cost increase look like? Is it approximately proportional to what you're getting? Um, just make sure you're looking into those things. Um, the next factor is, of course, features. What are you getting for the money? Is it what you need? Does the $4 host have as much as the $5 host have as much as the $10 host? Um, if you were looking at managed WordPress, um, if it starts at $20, like compare it to the host that charges $35. Like what are you getting for that money? Um, because like while WordPress hosting is a fairly mature category, people understand how to successfully host WordPress and optimize for it. Um, there's not necessarily a ton of agreement about like what features should come with it. Pretty much everybody, every managed WordPress host that's worth the time is going to include staging sites and nightly backups. But beyond that, like what else do they offer? Um, is the portal experience good? Um, what are the integrations there like? Do they, uh, like, for example, like where I work, we have this feature called visual comparison that it seeks to de-risk plugin updates, right? Because we'll run, the, we'll make a copy of your site and start running the plugin updates. And if any of them change how your site looks by more than a certain tolerance, we just won't run that update on your on your live site. Um, do they have features like kind of above and beyond staging and backups? Like what um, what have they built for you? What have they partnered to include? Sometimes people like to bundle third party features in, um, for example. So that's that's the next thing you're going to ask is like you know what are all the features and do I need all of these right like do I even care about this feature or that feature if you're just going to turn everything on to auto update and you just deal with it as it comes like maybe visual comparisons not that important to you um, that's okay too um, the thing about managed WordPress in particular is that we're trying to serve people in that space like my closest competitors like we're all trying to um, serve we're all trying to serve like the same kind of pool of people, but everybody in that pool like does things like in their own sort of idiosyncratic way. And so as soon as you decide to build a feature this way, there's somebody who's not going to like how you built it. And maybe they would be happier somewhere else. Like there's lots of different ways that these features get implemented. So that's something to pay attention to. You may find yourself buying like the first month of a lot of places just to kind of see what their portal experience is like. Finally, support. How much do you need and how fast? We have already established that if you are paying $5 a month for hosting, I'm sorry to say the support is not going to be amazing. Um, it just isn't. And, and that's okay. Um, but here's kind of the, here's the ugly secret about support. Really great web hosting support that's really great and knowledgeable at WordPress is very expensive to provide. It just is, right? Because if you think about it, somebody who is good enough with WordPress that they can just jump into a chat, a ticket, a phone call with you and resolve your problem very quickly and very deliberately, they're very smart and they know a lot about WordPress and they have a lot of career options. And something that happens, I know like where I work is frequently the people who are the best at it end up moving to other parts of the company because support is a really hard job and very stressful. And sometimes people don't like to stay in it forever. Um, so that is a thing to think about when you are um, buying support. That is why, like, in my opinion, a site, like a, a host that's only charging you $5 a month, like even if they're offering you telephone support, they desperately do not want you to call them. Because if you think about the cost of providing a highly qualified WordPress technician who speaks English well enough to provide support to an American, that person is expensive. And if you spend half an hour on the phone with them, you have just blown away like a year's worth of your, of your um, monthly fees, right? Like you become, they are now losing money on supporting you. Um, and that is just like, that's just the unpleasant reality of, of providing technical support, right? Is that the best people frequently do not wish to stay in support forever um, because they can make more money doing something else. Um, 
and and the customers who frequently need the most support are also the least profitable customers. That is that's just unpleasant truth, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, but that's why it's so important to to consider how much support you really need. Because if you feel like you're going to need a lot of help with your site, you should maybe think about like a slightly higher end option for your WordPress sites. That's all. Now, for um, an alternate to that, or just a, a side kind of like, because there's, there's also there's also the option of having like a cheaper support plan and just having a developer on staff. In sure. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you have a, a WordPress developer on um, on staff or on call, like that has its own expenses associated with it. But yeah, you may not need your web host to do much, though eventually that developer is going to have to talk to support for something, right? Like there's there's inevitably going to be like a caching issue totally, or yeah. something weird like that, that they're just not prepared because they don't necessarily have access to the server to debug all the things. But you are correct. Yeah, I'm totally speaking from experience because if you're, I feel like we're, the, the, these hosts just try to play too many different roles. Like you're hosting, but you also do all the support and whatever. And to your point, like you're saying, it's just hard to get all in one nice little package. So sometimes it makes sense to just have separation there. Yeah. And I think that like if your business depends on a WordPress site, you should think in advance about like a technical resource that can help you if, for example, um, a plugin update it proves to be incompatible with your theme or something like that, because those are the kinds of things that can and do happen with some regularity in WordPress. And you need to know how it's going to get fixed. Um, Cause your host is not going to fix, is not going to be able to fix that exactly. for you. They are almost nobody is going to take responsibility for your code. Certainly so you need those. to think about who's going to be fixing your code. So that's the third um, factor to think about how much support you need and how fast. And that, my friends, is the end of my slides. Are there other questions? So the question always comes up in WordPress groups is who's the best host? <laughs> it depends. It does. I think like if it? you if you take nothing else away from this, it's like the best host for somebody else is not necessarily the best host for you. Yep. Certainly you can ask for recommendations, right? Especially around support. It's mm -hmm. so much faster to find out how what experiences other people have had with support. However, yeah. I will also tell you that customers hate it when they find out that it was something they did that broke the site. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> and oh, and yeah. they will almost never admit it. Like, oh, my site was down all the time. Okay, but why though? How many plugins are you running? Are oh, they what, 872 what level of quality plugins. are they? <laughs> um, <laughs> so so I wouldn't I wouldn't if like your one buddy has like just terrible savage things to say about support at one host. I would encourage you to take that with a grain of salt. But certainly yeah. if you're hearing like a lot of it. You know, right. there's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important, but it is also important to have kind of a reasonable expectation of what level right. of support you're going to get from a host that you're paying $3 a month to versus a host that you're paying $30 a month to. Right. And I, I like that you said that, you know, you can be paying too much too, right? So like every fire doesn't need a fire hose. Sometimes they just need a cup of water. So there's all yeah. kinds of different ways that you, you can definitely be overpaying. Um, and you'll get the best service, but you might not need as much as that. Um, Emily's got a hand up. Oh, um, I think Joseph asked the question already, but um, okay. I'll ask it a little bit differently. Um, so with um, high end, he's asking about high end hosting. And I'm just wondering, like, I've heard every time I hear of Liquid Web, which, you know, um, I hear good things and like, it's like the higher end host and like people talk about moving to Liquid Web when they get big enough. And um, and so with um, the hosting that I have has been adequate so far for everything, but I'm wondering where is the tipping point when you decide um, to go from, you know, paying 30 bucks a month to paying a couple hundred bucks a month? Um, like, what is that? What's the differentiator there to go from one to the other? Sure. That is a great question. Wow. Okay, cool. Let's dig into that. Um, of course, the answer is it depends. Um, but I would say that like the number one thing I would think about is like, how, what is my time worth and how much of it am I spending 
dealing with stuff I don't want to deal with, right? Um, if your site is consistently like maxing out on resources and you don't feel like support is helping you enough, like the biggest reason that people like churn from from web hosts is like one of the biggest reasons is like they just they they don't like the support. They don't think feel like they're getting great support. Um, so if your if your support experience is consistently inadequate and you need a lot of it, um, that would be a good time to think about it, right? Um, because your time has value. And sometimes you can like narrow that down to like my time is worth X number of dollars per hour, especially I think you said you were you work for clients. So that means your time has a billable amount associated with it. How many hours in a month are you spending dealing with web hosting when you could be doing client work that you could bill for? That would be one tipping point to consider. Um, another tipping, another thing to consider is that you don't have to migrate everybody at once, right? You could continue to keep your current clients where they are and then try out somebody else. Um, and I feel like that's a really good option, especially if you have a couple of sites that maybe you're willing to migrate more than once. Um, so that's an option as well. Like you could just keep everything where you are and then like try out another host and then sort of move people over as it becomes available. That means you're paying like two hosting bills for a while. So again, do the math, figure out what works for your business. Um, but that's an option that you have as well. Um, another area where you could, where, where it's a tipping point is like, are you running out of resources in your current host, or are you re consistently running into the same technical problem that might indicate that the way that you're building your sites and the way the host is optimizing their platform are simply not compatible. That's a thing that happens. Um, and maybe you want to move someplace that'll deal with that instead. Um, mm -hmm. Those, those are a couple of the, that's where I would start asking the question is like, am I like, is, is the host no longer adequately hosting me? Um, do I need a higher level of support than I am currently getting? Um, do I need, um, do I want to spend less time dealing with technical stuff? That might be a good time to ask, like, do I want to get um, off of VPS and into managed or do I really just want to keep my site, my per site costs down and I don't mind dealing with the technical stuff? Maybe it's time to go from managed to VPS. Um, you know, and that's a that's a thing that we talk about internally at, at Nexus and Liquid Web because people like support will come to me and say, but this customer wants to continue running this old version of WordPress. I'm like, that is great. We have this wonderful product at Liquid Web called a VPS where they can do that. But over here on my managed platform, they may not. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it and so it really, so it's always about like, what, it, what are your technical needs? What are your business needs? Do you have and any, I, um, any, I like anything you could share about like the different types of high end hosting? Cause I'm really familiar with like the lower end, um, you know, like 30 to $50 or less um, per month. But can you talk about some of the higher end hosting and what that entails versus. Well, so it kind of depends on what you mean by higher end. Like if you're talking about. Yeah. Um, like I am not necessarily qualified to talk about like general purpose cloud clusters or bare metal. Um, that's not really my area. I have colleagues who are expert in that, um, but I am not right. Cause I focus on the managed WordPress and managed Magento side. Um, mm -hmm. but a question that our customers do tend to ask as they grow is like, do I need, like our, um, our managed WordPress plans are multi-tenant, which is just a, that's a fancy way of saying shared, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or do you want dedicated? Um, so like dedicated infrastructure, nobody else is on it. Um, and there are pluses and minuses to that. So um, one of them being that, um, you know, in a dedicated situation, it's much more like a dedicated managed WordPress is much more akin to a VPS situation at Liquid Web in the sense that like your stuff is isolated, but it is still like managed. So you're still not dealing with like the server stack. So it's kind of this cool hybrid. Um, that's an option that people have. And so like, okay, so dedicated or multi-tenant. In a multi-tenant environment, you are spread out across multiple hosts in the data center, right? If you have a hundred sites, 250 sites, you could be on like 50 different servers, right? 
that could mean that you could have fairly regular downtime events because there's planned maintenance, there's DDoS attacks, there's all kinds of things that happen. And then the cloud host becomes inaccessible. And then whatever you have on that cloud host also becomes inaccessible. If you have 250 sites and you're spread all out, a couple of your client sites might go down every week, not the same ones, but this week it could be client A and the over, next week it could be client B. And like the week after that, it could be client C. You could be talking or support a fair amount. On the other hand, you could be on a dedicated host and have everything in that one dedicated host. You are less exposed to the general purpose, like downtime risks that happen. But if, if your um, dedicated host goes down, all of your clients are down at the same time. And so it really just depends on like, what kind of pain do you want to deal with? Because there's going to be pain. Like it's, it's tech. There's always pain. Which pain? Um, and I feel like that's a, an important question for, um, for our customers to ask themselves um, at Nexus. And I can't necessarily speak to the particular offerings like at my competitors because I don't know. Um, everybody's got their own like quirk. Um, these are ours. Great. Thank you. Hmm? Trevor. You're muted. I am muted. Sorry about that. Um, Joseph, did that answer your question? Hello. Yeah, I was talking with uh, Emily like about the um, high end level hosting like bare metal and getting your 16 core 20 gig of memory. But yes, it clarified everything. So that's great. I mean, lots of places do offer that. Like I said, I am less qualified to speak on that. Um, that's just not my area of expertise. But it's, I mean, it's, I'm aware of it mostly because like Liquid Web, the Liquid Web family of brands um, is sort of kind of expanding its portfolios up and down the, the chain, right? And so when you start getting into that, you start getting into things like infrastructure as a service, where, lit where we're literally just sort of selling you like, here's a bunch of servers go nuts. Right. Um, and so if you have, if you have that level of need, um, you are beyond my capacity to advise you, but you probably at some point have technical resources who can advise you. Is it also like uh, for traffic, like when you just have too much traffic and you outgrow these servers and that just causing a lot mm -hmm. of problems? Absolutely. Um, traffic absolutely is a reason that people outgrow their servers. There's lots of different ways to sort of mitigate that like for example like lots of people use cloudflare and that can kind of put off the amount of time before you have to upgrade a server because they do a lot of like caching at the edge and things like that um but then eventually like eventually like a word think about like a woocommerce store right every time you place an order that's a bunch of like calls to the database and um the more people you have doing that at the same time, the greater chance of what we call concurrency. Um, and so, you know, and uh, this kind of gets into like PHP, do you know what like PHP workers are? A PHP workers you can think of as like a call to the database. It can, a PHP worker can do one call to the database at a time. And each of those calls is like a fraction of a second. But if you get enough of them going, you can sort of overwhelm your pool of PHP workers and suddenly your customers are noticing latency. And so that's what we're starting to, that's what we call concurrency is like how many times does PHP have to interact with the database at one time? Um, at some point, no matter how much like caching and stuff you throw in front of your, your WordPress site, at some point as you grow, you're gonna overwhelm your pool of PHP workers and you're gonna need more. And that's the kind of, that's when you're starting to talk about like upgrades. Um, and then eventually, like as your needs get bigger and more complex, like you tend to need more resources or eventually you kind of move out of one environment and into another because now that environment serves you better. And there are, you know, there's hosting options, even like specialized to WordPress up and down that scale, right? There's WordPress VIP, there's Pagely, there's, um, there's all kinds of like just sort of hosts meant for like high availability, high demand, um, high traffic 
high redundancy kinds of things. Like if you're the New York Times and you're running your blog section on WordPress, like your needs are going to be very different than anything we've discussed in this presentation. <laughs> Awesome. Did that answer your question, Trevor? Um, actually, so no, I just wanted to make sure that Joe's was gotcha. Okay, uh, so you have another question. Mm -hmm. So Go I ahead. do have a question. So let's say I'm deciding that I'm going to change server or I'm going to change hosting. Um, now for me, I'll be honest, it's going to be from cheap to cheap, uh, sure. or cheap to cheaper if I can hit, if I can find it. But what type of steps should somebody go through, and what type of a timeline do you need? to change hosting? So it can be done fairly quickly, depending on how busy the site is. Like the answer is gonna be different for like an active WooCommerce store that's taking orders every day, every hour versus like a static site. Cause if it's a static site, you could probably get it done in an afternoon without a ton of planning. You could do it on a whim. Um, there are plenty of, so there's a service called Blog Vault, or a company called Blog Vault that has a service called is it migrate wizard? I don't know, but lots of hosts have like a migrate to our hosting plugin and it's just white labeled blog vault. And if that's the case, what you do is you buy your hosting, you buy your new, your new hosting, you install the plugin on the existing site, and then you plug in your credentials from the new site and it just copies everything over. And it takes like an hour if your site's not too big, sometimes less if your site's very small. And then you just have to um, repoint your domain. And like that takes a little bit of time. There's propagation for DNS and everything. But you can do that very quickly. And if the site is static and is not constantly getting new content in it, you can do it in an afternoon, no big deal. If you have a WooCommerce store and you're getting orders, like you're copying stuff over, but meanwhile, stuff is still happening on your new site. And you have to find a way to accommodate that. Um, and that can be very challenging in a store kind of situation. What I would recommend for most people, especially if they do not have like a tech team, is put the store, um, like take this, like just take the store out of like transaction mode, like set it to testing mode so that it's not taking new orders while you complete the changeover. And even if you do have a tech team, like I worked on a um like a WooCommerce migration a couple of years ago where there was still going to be a period of time where we just could not accept new orders. And we tried to like make it late at night. We tried to we put like a banner on the site and all of that stuff because we had to plan ahead because this was someone's business. Um, but, you know, that's that's what we did. We just had to like stop time out, stop putting credit cards into our store <laughs> so we can move it. Um, and that's. And that can be done as well. Um, I moved a very large site once um, that was had a very, very active like comment community, like commenting community. And there was at one point I had to go back to the old site and like export out the comments that had been missed in the migration and re-import them to the new site. Like you just have to really be careful about checking that for sites that are very active. But for a site that's more static, shouldn't it shouldn't be that hard. There are plugins that do that for you now. It's really easy. What, what, okay. you, it, you, what was the name of the of the company or, or the plugin that you talked about? You you said it, I couldn't understand you. Sure, blog vault, blog like a WordPress blog, vault like at a bank, blog vault. And is there concerns with when this hosting is ending? Do you have to do it a month ahead of time or? I mean, typically you will have some kind, like you are going to want to have some kind of overlap, whether that's a week okay. worth of overlap or a month worth of overlap kind of depends on how motivated you are. But I would not cancel the old hosting until I was sure that I was up and running on the new host and that everything I cared about had been migrated. Because remember, like I'm over here talking about your WordPress site, but lots of hosts include free email. Do you have mail in an email box that you care about? You got to figure out what you're doing with that too. Um, so that's something else to think about is like, sometimes it's more than just your WordPress site. Sometimes, even if your mail isn't hosted at, um, hosted at your host, sometimes you bought your domain there and it's holding all of the DNS records. And then you got to make sure that like your MX records are repointed so that your email gets delivered to the new place. 
So you definitely want to think like outside just the individual WordPress as well. Okay, thank you. Jim, you have your hand up. Um, as somebody who does that live and breathe uh, WordPress for, our, for my living, like everybody else here on the call, uh, it was a great presentation. It was very helpful. I would have liked to have seen a chart at the end where you list some of the vendors and names of the different categories. Um, just because I, you know, I don't, you know, I know SiteGround and Liquid Web and about two others, but I don't know, you know, just, just FYI. Um, no, it's a, it's a good suggestion. There are so many. Right. There well, are so I, many. Sure. But, but I mean, there's, um, the other thing I'm trying to get my head, head around is I'm trying to view this as, okay, am I buying a little moped? Am I buying, mm -hmm. you know, a Ford or a Ford or a Chevy? Okay. In the middle mm -hmm. of the road, they're both going to get me A to B. Yeah. You've got your Chevy fans, you get your Ford fans, but it's a car. And then, you know, do I go up to them? Do I buy a pickup truck? And then do I go up and buy a Rolls Royce? I mean, you mm -hmm. know, that's kind of an analogy that I can understand. Sure. And and I'm just trying to, you know, wrap my, you know, wrap my head around, um, you know, who these vendors are and what my options are. Sure. Well, and, and I think an important thing to remember, and we talked about this a second ago, is like the host you pick today does not have to be your forever host. Right. Is migrating a little bit of a pain in the neck? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, because there's a lot of things you have to think about, especially if your site is busy. And I know you have stores. And so that's something that you that you will be concerned about. But the host that you are on does not have to be your host forever. And a lot of hosts actually offer free migration as a way to like get people in the door, right? Because remember, we're all like, we're all competing over the same pool of WordPress users. And so everybody wants to make it as easy as possible to move for them. So like, for example, where I work, we have not only our self-service plugin, which is Blog Vault, but we also have a migration team. Like if you don't want to handle the migration yourself, our migration team will just migrate your site for you. Um, and that's like free when you sign up. So like those are things that, um, that your host can do for you. Like if you are on... Um, like one of the lower end hosts right now and you decide like, you know, you know what, I really want like that higher level of service or that higher level of features. Like you can move, you can always move. I wouldn't do it casually because yes, it is a little bit of a pain in the neck, but um, it can be done. It's not, people do it all the time. People do it all the time. Is there a basic ch checklist of, you know, you know, at least chap at a chapter level of things you have to consider when moving a, um, uh, a a website to a new host, you know, because you know you you just kind of mentioned some of them. Yeah, they can they can help you migrate, but you know, oh, have you thought about your email? You know, you got to repoint a DNS, so you got to do this, do that. Is there a, is there any place that us you know, it, Michelle and Trevor know? I've had this old site for years, and and um, Yahoo SiteGround. I mean, it's been stagnant, but it, but I've got old videos that still point to it and whatnot. I need to shut that down, and I need to move it to my host currently, a site ground um, for all my other sites. But I need to, you know, I need to, you know, and I and I'm just going to put up a single page. You know, thank you for coming to TrueCreations.biz. And here's here's the, here are the new sites you need to go to and and have them redirected. Um, you know, so it's nothing fancy, but I, I mean, I just, I, I sit here being non-technical. I don't even know where to start. You know, I don't know where, yeah. you know, you know, so I'm looking for that little, you know, six point checklist that, um, so, you know, yeah, you got to figure this out, this, uh, this out. Do I get that typically so, from the host? So much of those, so much of that is definitely, well, it depends. Like the answer yeah, uh, to all I WordPress understand. questions. Yep. Um, but I think like, if it really is just about, because it sounds like you're not even trying to pr to preserve the actual website, right? You're really just trying to point the URL someplace. Right, right. Right? Yeah. What I would do in that case is I would get that landing page stood up at SiteGround. Okay. And then I would worry about my domain. 
The only exception to that would be, do you have, do you receive email at that domain? And then that's, that's the question to ask. Yeah. Like, is there an email address associated with that domain name? If not, it's that easy. Stand up the, stand up the site, um, stand up the landing page, point the domain at it. Once the domain finishes propagating, um, cancel the old account. That's all. And then what about the email? Well, so if you have email at the old host, um, I, I mean, you I don't, may need. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really need to archive old email. It's just mm -hmm. you know on a go forward basis. So just move sure email to SiteGround. So when you are, um, if you're if you're just worried about capturing new email going through, I would make sure that you set up the MX records at the time that you're pointing the domain. And make sure that you're, their point, the like, um, if you've got like a forwarder, make sure that forwarder is set up at site ground as well. So, so point domain with what you call it, MX. Um. Well, so you point the domain with like the DNS record, so that's like the A record or the C name record or whatever it is. Right. Um. The email records for your DNS are called MX. It stands for Mail Exchange. Super. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, you know, it's relatively easy. I just haven't done it. So the landing page, point the domain with MX records, and everything should still continue work. Yeah, because I push the uh, email to um, Outlook. Mm -hmm. so, well, so you'll you. also then at that point need to make sure that you're downloading the email from the new location. Right. Unless you mean by pushing, you just mean a forward to your outlook.com address, in which case the, just make sure the forwarder is set up. All right. So download new address for Outlook email. Okay. Three steps, relatively straightforward. I'll call I'll call Michelle and, and Tricia and Emily, Emily and everybody else when I get in trouble. <laughs> In like a week, Michelle's gonna be pinging me in Slack. Like Tiff, this is your fault. <laughs> yeah. it was, it, it Tiff, was you gotta nice, help him. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a very, it's been a, it was a very nice, clear, distinct presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions Any? for Trisha? Of oh, Trisha, sorry, uh, she said Trisha. Any other questions for Tiffany? I do know your name. I promise. <laughs> Uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for presenting tonight. We do um, usually reserve time at the end for questions that are unrelated to the presentation. So you're welcome to stick around for that. I would ask you to take your slides down though when you get a chance. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna throw some of those domains back in the list here. If you weren't here at the beginning, WordCamp Rochester is coming up on September 30th. You can, so you can buy your tickets now, it's $25 for the day. You can also apply to speak and apply to volunteer. You can uh, join our Facebook group if you're not already in there. You can apply to speak at WordCamp Montreal, which is all online, so you can speak remotely. And then also I threw the Twitter up there for WordCamp Rochester in case you want to follow along and see what we're doing with that. Um, questions about anything else? Anything under the sun? Well, WordPress related. <laughs> not everybody all at once. Try to control yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> all any, right uh, any any thought about getting back together in person nobody has asked me uh, yet to even think about that so i've just been working ahead doing it online when i did try to do that some of that last year nobody wanted to do it so i stopped and i'm waiting for people to say let's get together in person again so no i haven't done anything with that yet if anybody's interested though we can certainly look at that I don't know where for sure, but it's a possibility. Yeah, <laughs> Joseph, I know. We have a lot of people that tend to join us from all over the place. So it, it kind of feels bad to go back to in-person and like lose some of our regular attendees now. Um, but we can always do hybrids and we could do in-person, uh, what do we call them? Uh, Co-working and keep the meetups online too. So we'll take a look at that going forward. I feel like you could fit everybody in that little office here. Oh, my my office here? I don't think so. 
Uh, well, you just move some of the guitars around, you know. This is the second bedroom in my condo, so I'm going to go with no. <laughs> where, where in Australia are you, Joseph? I'm I'm in Adelaide in South Australia. A lot of yep. people don't know Adelaide. Um, they think of Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne, basically. But I'm down south, and it's a really hidden gem that nobody knows about it because we've got everything here except snow, which is not necessarily a bad thing. My, uh, my son was in Exmouth putting up a telescope, and the, the uh, main facility was in your town. Yeah. So, He's been, he's, pretty good. Back and forth. he's been there back a couple of times. So. Yeah, it's good that he's heard of Adelaide because a lot of people don't. Even when I travel, they go, are you from Sydney? Are you from Melbourne? No, Adelaide. So it's pretty good. Yeah. I've seen a lot of TikToks where they ask somebody where the capital of Australia is and nobody knows it. And I'm always like, I know it. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody says Sydney. I'm like, nope. That's so, right. right. Everybody so, thinks it's Sydney. <laughs> did you say you do or do not have snow? We don't have snow in Adelaide. We have snow in um, Melbourne. And yep. there's also in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. They have snow there and it's pretty cold. But where I am, there is no snow. What about Mount Lofty? Yeah, that's not real snow. That's like flakes. <laughs> it doesn't mean <really laughs> snow. You can't ski there. A <laughs> little bit of snow. My, yeah. brother, my, my brother spent the winter at, um, oh, God, I just lost the name of it. One of the uh, Perisher Valley. There's a Perisher Valley in. Is that yeah, the, Perisher, yeah, Perisher Blue. Yeah, that's yeah. in Canberra. Yeah. Yes. That has snow and you can go skiing there. Same yeah. as Mount Buller in Melbourne. And there is Australian Alps as well in Victoria, where Melbourne is. And I only learned.